All right. I think we're back. Am I am I muted, Yushai? I see a little mute icon. <laughs> anyway, uh, sorry, folks. Just had to grab a quick drink of water. Uh, hold on, Gibbs. I'll introduce you in just a sec. <laughs> so coming up next, we have Brian B.T. Gibbs. He's going to be giving a talk on building your audio brand. Gibbs is a co-owner and principal at Skyline Entertainment and Publishing, also Toolshed Studios in Silicon Valley. He had 30 plus record credits in 2020 alone. He's got a BM from Berklee College of Music and Jazz Composition. He's an expert record producer, mixing engineer. He's worked on records in the Bay Area and everywhere else, uh, including some famous ones uh, <laughs> like the 2015 Grammy Award for Best Regional Mexican Album, uh, Realidades. And oh, there's so many things that I could say about Gibbs. I'll just summarize it by saying he's been coming to the meetup for the last year as uh, one of our professionals in residence. Uh, Gibbs has been a tremendous talent. And his, his the time that he has been giving to our group as a to give feedback, he's given workshops on vocal production. It has just been a gift. And we are really happy that he's here today to talk about another topic that he's talked a little bit about, but sort of more in depth today, and that is building your audio brand. So without further ado, let's bring Gibbs on. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome. I wasn't able to hear Gene, but I'm sure whatever he said was awesome. So thank you, Gene Forrest, for putting this together, Ishai. Uh, and Adrian for working in the background, and everybody that comes to the uh, music production workshop a couple Tuesdays a month to to share their work and to learn from others. And it's a very positive, uh, creative space. The pandemic has allowed us to all meet online. And some of the presenters that we've seen today have been because of that. A lot of virtual friends that uh, we met so to Gene or Ishai or Forrest, whoever's watching the chat, I, I saw Forrest and Gene were pretty busy in there. I'm going to ask for a lot of questions. I'm going to wrap at um, five of five so that we've, we've got a good 10 minutes for, for dialogue. So put your questions in the chat and we'll talk about how to make money in this crazy business. A lot of what's been talked about today has been around um, artists making business. And for those of you that uh, produce music uh, in that producer role, which we'll talk about. You can think of yourself as an artist. Some producers have become artists. Some of them are huge, right? And they perform live as well. So how can you actually make money doing this? Do you want to be the face of your brand? Do you want to be behind the scenes? Do you want to... There are so many different things you can do in audio that it's dizzying sometimes, but not all of us realize all of the opportunities that are that are available to us. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how to make uh, uh, money in, in this crazy business. So why am I here? Um, uh, why would I be talking? Uh, what do I do? Um, I'm very involved, and this will be an over uh, overriding theme for what I talk about today in a variety of organizations. The, the, the two that I spend the most time with is the Audio Engineering Society and the San Francisco section, and also the Recording Academy. Um, I'm also a mentor uh, for Berkeley College of Music uh, as an alumni, and I have a couple of mentees that I meet with throughout the summer. And that's very rewarding because it keeps me connected with the school, keeps me con what, connected with what's going on and what's being taught. Um, right now, what's fresh in terms of academics around different um, disciplines. I was a jazz composition major. My mentees both happen to be film scoring majors, which is interesting because I was not a film scoring major, but I get a little bit of insight into the world and what they're looking to do as they come out of school and look for work so they can repay those uh, hefty student loans that they most likely have. So I can't understate enough about getting involved um, if you have the credits, joining the Bo Recording Academy as a voting member is wonderful. Uh, yes, going to the Grammys is fun, but really being part of the process. I see a lot of people making comments about, oh, this should have won for that, and this didn't even get nominated, and 
my thought, uh, although restraint, restraint of pen and tongue, I don't make comments on social media uh, because I am on the board of governors, but my thought to myself is, well, if you think something else should have happened, then you should join and you should be part of the dialogue. You should be part of the conversation and you should become a voting member so you can vote, so you can submit things um, to be considered for nomination. And for the Audio Engineering Society, that has opened my eyes. There are so many things, and a lot of what I talk about probably will be around the what AES is. AES.org has a job board. There is a job board there that talk, uh, has all these audio jobs all around the world. Some are remote, some are um, local to where we're at, and opportunities to work in audio. There's also some crazy places that I would have never thought of that you could work in audio make a good living, pay rent in Silicon Valley, which is not inexpensive, pay your, you know, have good medical coverage, all of those things. So we'll, we'll, we'll get into that. All right. So topics, do what you love, love what you do. Um, I had a corporate career that paralleled my music career for a while And thankfully, that paid for a lot of what we've been able to uh, do. When I say we, there is is a partnership um, that Skyline Entertainment and Publishing is part of. So we have our record label, we have our publishing label, and then we have the studio, Toolshed Studios, which you see on the banner uh, and branding behind me. Uh, I see you, Suzanne, with the branding. And Richard, uh, that was a great presentation. Richie, Richie Sloan checking in today. It was good to see you on here. So doing what you love. I didn't hate my corporate job, uh, but I always knew that I would do this. I would do my corporate job. I would really put in that time and then it would do this and I would cross over and I would uh, get into music full time. So that's part of that future planning we'll talk about a little bit later. So what are you worth? What is your production worth? Um, what price? How do you price yourself? How do you, you can't, have income unless you've got some sort of rate that you can quote to people and mine has changed over time and then we'll talk about business structures all the fun stuff bookkeeping insurance protecting yourself your business artist uh you know your 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 customers and then clarence and clarence uh, i'll talk about that a little more uh, later and then building a team Uh, this has been talked about in a variety of presentations throughout today and then continuing your your education. So you got to ask yourself, what do I excel at? What, what, what do I love? Do I want to be a record producer? Do I want to be a co-producer beat maker? Um, Do I want to be a recording engineer, a mixing engineer, a mastering engineer? Do I love live sound? Do I want to be an audio tech uh, guru and repair consoles and vintage microphones. There's a variety of things that you can do in this realm that will make you money. I didn't even, I I didn't even put in my bullet point here. Um, Well, I did. I'm sorry. Audio tech repair, coding and programming. We're in Silicon Valley. (laughs) There's a massive amount of people. A lot of them are Berkeley alums, which is how I know about this, that work at Apple Music, that work on Final Cut, uh, on the, cause there's audio involved with final cut. They work on logic pro X. Um, but some of you use as a DAW. Well, guess what? If you're good at programming and coding and you know a little bit about the platform, why wouldn't you look into getting a job working at Apple on logic? Um, uh, and so there's uh, Facebook with Oculus and all of their audio content and their 360 content the list goes on and on and on. Every tech company in Silicon Valley needs audio engineers. The one that was a wild, wildest for me, I had an audio engineer. He was here, was interning, moved from a uh, student intern to paid intern. And he calls me one day and he says, hey, I got a job. I said, awesome. Not expecting him to say it was an audio. I said, what are you doing? He goes, I'm going to be an audio engineer. I'm like, what? <laughs> awesome. Like very awesome. I said, where are you going to be working? He says, into it. I said, like Quick and QuickBooks? Apparently, they have a whole AV team. They make all these training videos, and they have all these corporate events, and they put on presentations around the world, and they've got this internal group. 
that it's got to go and set up audio video to make internal promotional videos and training and all, all of these. I just, I would have never said to, well, up to that point, I would have never said to somebody that came here to intern or an assistant engineer that wanted to make a living. And that's what he said to me. I'm going to make a living. He's, he's got married. He's been married. He's got kids and he's supporting himself with a r really great salary with really great benefits. We're going to get into it. Uh, and I would have never pointed him in that direction. So he's doing audio for a living and then he gets to work on his own passion projects that that funds. Um, my corporate job was way far removed, but it gave me a lot of business acumen, which I appreciate, but it had nothing to do, uh, with, with music. Some of it was creative, but not for the most part. Okay. So you got to think outside the box when it comes to, to jobs. And then do you want to be a performing artist or a recording artist? Two totally different things. Sometimes they are the same, but that's like the 1% of 1%. Meaning the 1% of 1% that's really surviving and making a living doing this. Don't knock the one hit wonders. There's lots of people out there that have had that one hit. Uh, and that has, you know, do they want to play it 200 nights a year? Well, if that's your one hit, you're going to have to. Uh, but that one hit can pay a lot of bills for a lot of years. Uh, I remember hearing an interview with uh, Kid Rock, and he did uh, All Summer Long, and he mashed up Sweet Home Alabama and Warren Zevon uh, Werewolf in London. So the hook was Sweet Home Alabama. The verses were Werewolves of London. You'll find they're nearly identical in their structure. He got a call from Johnny Van Zant, uh, may he rest in peace, uh, widow, who said, "Thank you for putting my seven grandkids through school, through college, because basically by doing that, those songwriting royalties were going to." But of course, I mean, this is Kid Rock. He's already got a career. He's got a. He's he's known. That song was a huge hit. It was one of the songs of the summer, maybe ten years ago. But it generated a lot of money. He's had other hits, but like I'm just I'm just using that one song as an example. Something just like that could pay a lot of bills. Now he made a lot of publishing money. They made a lot of songwriting money, um, and so everybody made out with something like that. But just that one could be enough. Um, a local band that's in the area, Smash Mouth. They're great. They had a couple of hits, and they had a complete resurgence when they did a cover song for the movie Shrek. And now all of a sudden, boom, they're back out. They're touring with those those hit songs and playing shows. And again, you know, did, did they have a catalog like Michael Jackson or the Beatles or the Eagles or uh, or some of the more, you know, a Lady Gaga? Um, not necessarily, but that's okay. That's totally fine. Now, the other thing I'll say is, don't just go chasing that one hit. I'm going to get that one hit. I'm going to get that one hit. And then, you know, 20 years later, you're hunched over the console. I'm going to get that one hit. I'm going to get that one hit. You got to be realistic about what your goals are and understand the business of music, and which is why you're here today, uh, which kudos to everybody that's been watching today to try to learn something about developing their career. So do I love the music business or I just love music? I've heard that talked about quite a bit today. And that second word, business, super important. And you can be an independent artist. That's totally fine. If you want to be really study a student of being an independent artist, go study Chance the Rapper. Go look up everything and anything he's ever talked about in a podcast or a uh, interview on TV, uh, NPR about him and being independent and how he had to build his own uh, team. I heard this reference today. I can't remember exactly whose presentation it was, but you know, he brought all these people up of uh, what he won like four Grammys that day. And he brought up a bunch of people and said, this is my advertising person, my marketing person. This is my social media person, two different jobs. This is my accountant. This is my attorney. This is my other attorney. Like he had built this village around him of people that could help him get to where he needed to get to. Now he could go to a record label and they would provide that for him, but he built it himself. So if you really love the music business, then become a student of the music business. If you just love music, that's totally fine. But maybe 
just strictly a, a, a job in audio only or in music only, maybe maybe it just stays a hobby. And again, there's nothing wrong with that. It's totally fine. So I have this. Um, I'm going to go back to this record producer, co-producer, beat maker, recording, mixing, and mastering engineer discussion. I got I grabbed a screenshot of the song "Sober" by Lord, and if you look, so Jack Antonoff, Cook Harrell, Lord, and Malay. Now, if you look, additional producer Cook Harrell and Cook, he uh, I get to meet him. Oh my gosh, it's probably uh, six or seven years ago now, but he produces the biggest vocalists in the world rihanna beyonce you you name it he produces her vocal and he is a vocal producer he takes the approved demos from the label you know whoever the songwriter was in lord's case you know she wrote the song but he produced that vocal to convey what these songs mean and he didn't produce every vocal on this album but he did on this particular record from the album and a few other records on the album. Now, you can be very niche, and I suggest that. I suggest that you define your genre, that you bring things in and say, I am very good with trap or Latin or Latin trap or trip hop or I love rock, uh, singer songwriter, alternative. Uh, when people ask me, what, what do you? produce i just say yes because i do a wide variety of things i've done two alternative releases a children's release a jazz album and a country album country single all within the last year but i i i do tell people where do i excel you know i don't excel here here and here but i know the right people that do so as a as a record producer i have the right contacts with the right studio musicians to book the right studio time. Yes, we have a studio here, but it doesn't necessarily mean the production's going to happen here. I am I might work with an artist that's not physically here. We might do the, everything remote, and then I've got to send that artist into a studio in Nashville or Los Angeles or Austin or New York. So having a, a, a network of contacts where I can pick up the phone, talk to an engineer and say, we're going to book time here. I call the studio, I book the time, I negotiate the rate, negotiate the rate with the engineer. I'm on I'm online, remote listening, whether cutting, whatever they're cutting, whether it's a vocal or performance, or musicians that I know and trust that, you know, there's certain instruments I'm I'm not going to try to mimic digitally. Uh like uh, I don't know, a pedal steel or a violin, cello, fiddle parts for a country record. Um can I play banjo? Mm. Am I a great banjo player? Mm. So knowing the right people to pick up the phone and call and say, you know, is your is this still your rate? And we'll talk about paying people for their work a little bit later. And getting the right people to play on the right album, on the right song. Because not every record on the album might be the right thing for that particular player to play on. So Managing the entire process from pre-production all the way through to distribution is what I tell people that I do. When it comes to co-producers and beat makers, that's part of what brought me to the SVMP to begin with was looking for talent because sometimes, you know, can I do it? Sure. Do I love it? Mm, maybe. It depends on the project. Do I want to do it? Maybe not. So maybe I want to hire somebody to do that and collaborate with somebody. And then, you know, that's part of the budget. That's part of what goes into the whole, the whole deal. So having a network of people, super important. Um, and being able to manage, you know, contracts and read contracts that was referenced earlier today about, about the presentation regarding IP. It's super important to read and ask questions and, and reach out to people about that. So, um, you know, when, when you're talking about being a producer, you really need to be able to define to people what that is. You know, I typically work on my own. I, you know, I, and I make, make background track, backing tracks for vocalists. You know, maybe you don't produce vocals. Maybe you don't uh, work with hiring bands to come in or, or session musicians to come in and play on a record. Maybe that's not what you do. So being very clear with people as to what you're able to do is the first step in getting work. 
because now they know what they can hire you for. Being a uh, jack of all trades and master of none is dangerous, super dangerous. Okay, I've harped on that enough. Uh, let's next. Oh, my value. How do I price myself? Well, what are my liabilities? <laughs> what do I need to do to pay my rent? And you need to pay everyone as well. That's included in your liabilities. How can you grow? If you only charge enough just to pay your rent and you're living check to check, how are you going to grow? Uh, future planning and goals, who are your competitors and who are your target customers? And your customers might be artists. Your customers might be some company down the road that needs a voiceover on a commercial that they're going to do for their website. I don't know. It could be a variety of things. Maybe you don't want to do any engineering or voiceover work. Maybe you just want to produce backing tracks to sell. Fine. But you really need to know what are you doing? What is your product, producer, product, right? And to what extent are you providing them? Uh, what, what are they buying? What are they, what are they paying for? So one way to do that is to work backwards. A couple of ways you can work backwards is just amount of time. So somebody comes to me and says, oh, what's your hourly rate? And I don't answer that question. And I say, well, tell me what you're looking to do. I mean, I'm not going to modify my rate based on what you're looking to do, but I might be able to just give you a flat amount. You start buying per hour and you could rack up a lot where if we just, you tell me what it is that you need, I might be able to just give you a flat dollar amount and you're done with it. Because I've seen people come in thinking they only need, oh, I just need a few hours in the studio. A few hours in the studio is never just a few hours in the studio, unless they've done a ton of work ahead of time at home. So when people can describe to me what the project is, I can better price what it is that they're, that they're looking to do. So how do I set my rate? I do that based on knowing what I've got to cover. So let's just say, for example, I don't know, uh, your rent is two grand a month. That's pretty inexpensive, but maybe you're sharing a room in, in Silicon Valley. So you got two grand a month, you got health care, you need to eat, and you want to put a little money away to buy some more equipment. And so now we're in the 3,500 a month range. Oh, you've got a car, so you got a car payment. So now you're at four grand a month. So maybe your minimum to support yourself is four grand a month. Okay. So that means you need 10 projects a month that are going to bring in 400 bucks, or you need to make, you know, it's 30 days in a month, but you don't want to work every day of the, of the month. Fine. You only want to work five days a week. Okay. Five days a week. You need to make a hundred bucks a day. It's $500 uh, uh, a week. Oh, but that's only two grand a month. Mm, no, now I need to make a thousand dollars a day, right? To get, the f well, no, that wouldn't be, it would be 500, sorry, 2,500 a week. Uh, if you're making 500 a day, but if you're figuring it out based on the math that I'm illustrating, as in, I need to make X amount per day consistently, then you know what target you need to go after when you say, okay, I need to make four grand a month. Okay. At that hundred bucks a day, $500 a week is not going to get you there, but $200 a day, thousand dollars a week that will get you there. $500 a day will exceed what you're looking for. But maybe you need to make $500 a day for the days that you make 50 bucks, right? So you really need to figure out work. If you do the backwards scenario, here's what I need to cover. Plus, I want to make X to be able to expand. So I need to make this type of money. Then I got to go out and find that money. And there's I mean, people talking all day in this, this workshop on how you can make money. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So that's from the liability standpoint. The other way you can do it is just say, this project's going to take me four hours. Minimum wage is 15. That's only 60 bucks. Let me round up to a hundred. I'll charge them a hundred bucks. Okay. So it's going to cost, now you're charging $33 an hour. Uh, maybe you want to charge 50 an hour. Okay. So you quote them $150 and it's okay to let work walk out the door. That happens frequently. You know, people say, oh, that's, that's, that, that's, that's too much for my budget. I said, okay, well, we could do this and this would get you part of the way. And then you, I could help you find a way that here's what you could do at home to chop down what you've just explained to me is about 30 hours of work. And maybe you can do 10 of those hours on your own. And I could show you how to do that 
as we're working through these other 20 hours, that'll give you enough information to go home to your setup. I'll even help you get your acoustics right so you can record things at home or whatever it might be. Maybe they do the VO at home. Uh, audiobooks are a good example. We get calls about audiobooks or uh, podcasts. A lot of times I'll set them up so they can do it on their own. Now, am I sending money out the door? Maybe. Do I want to sit and listen to six hours of audiobook tracking? Maybe. Um, but they're going to need somebody to edit that. And that's where people's skills don't, they don't have the editing skills. So we're happy to edit the audiobook for you. But I'll help you get to the point where you can record it at home. You're nice and relaxed. You're not stressed because of some engineer falling asleep, pressing the record button or rewinding while you're recording your audiobook. So it's this give and take of, you know, ask for what you feel your time is worth. F try to figure out well, how long is this project going to take me? I'm going to spend X amount of hours. My time is worth X amount per hour. And there's your pricing. Um, and then competitors, what are your competitors charging? Is, is it reasonable? Is it a little more expensive? Is it a lot more expensive? If it's a lot more expensive, you might lose a little bit of work or a lot of work to another local competitor, but maybe that's okay. I mean, there's other studios that are down here in the South Bay that are doing tons of work. They're busy all the time, but it's not necessarily work that we're looking to do. We have a different thing going at, at our at our location. So it's okay that it's not a kind of revolving door and people are kind of coming in and, you know, spitting bars and doing this and singing over this, or maybe they're recording a guitar part and running out the door. And do we do that? Sure. Somebody just kind of come in and lay down drums and run out the door. Sure. Or record on a piano that, yeah, that happens all the time. Um, but, uh, not at the kind of, you know, we don't do it on that kind of revolving door type of basis, but we've made a decision that that's not what the studio is going to be. And then who do you want to work with? Like who, who do you really, um, want to be on your credit list and always make sure that if you engineer that that metadata like i showed that screenshot with the the record uh, from lord's album you get credit you need to build credit so people can look up things that you've done people can go on title and search your name or spotify and search your name and oh produced a few things so you know make sure that you're getting credit for the work that you do and uh, one last thing on liabilities, pay everybody. I, I put that bullet underneath liabilities. G try to minimize your quid pro quo. <laughs> because somebody's going to come back to you three years later and go, I uh, remember the thing we did in blah, blah, blah. I, wanna, I need to use your studio for a day. Well, I, I can't have my studio down for a day. I could have three years ago, maybe, when we were still building. But now we're busy. I, I, don't, I don't know where I'm going to find a day to let you use the studio. And I appreciate what you did back then, but here, let me just pay you instead. And then I don't have that hanging over. Because um, people, th th revisionist history is is common. <laughs> and it's not because people decide they want to try to take advantage of you. They just, they don't remember. You don't remember. So it's really important that you pay people, you document things. I'll, I'll give you a, a, a secret sauce uh, on what I do. When people pay me in cash, I ask them, okay, hold it out. I take a picture with my phone and I text that picture to them and I put how much they paid me because I don't want any question later. Oh, I gave you a hundred bucks. Oh, no, I gave you 150. No, I gave you, no, there's a text. There's the fanned out money. Let's zoom in 20, 40, 60. And like you count the cash right in your hand. Are those your hands? Yes. Is this your text thread? Yes. And then nobody's questioning how much was paid uh, in cash. And um, okay, so. Let's, let's move on. So technical stuff that nobody wants to deal with. Um, how should you structure yourself? Well, sole proprietorships are fine. And once you start making money, you need to start writing off as much as you can. But any CPA will tell you, maybe not a bookkeeper might not tell you this, but an accountant will, that you can't have deductions if you don't have income. So all that stuff you're buying and oh ableton they just released the uh the newest version and i want to buy that and oh plugins and the fomo plug-in fomo oh no i'm not gonna have that cool blah 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 stock plugins are great 
I work with stock plugins a lot. Um, so filing a Schedule C is great. You can't really file for free, I don't think, on Quick QuickBooks or Quick uh, free TurboTax. I don't think. I think you have to pay. It's another like sixty bucks, maybe a hundred bucks to file a Schedule C. But that's also an expense. So if you want to start writing things off, you need to start filing a Schedule C. But you need to have income before you can start writing off liabilities. Even a hundred dollars, you make a hundred bucks for the year. Declare it and write off things that you purchased that year. You have large purchases that need to be amortized. Um, you know those those types of things also can be can help reduce. So if you're doing the like I did for a while, I have a corporate gig and I have the music gig. Well, that music gig and those write offs are helping me offset the tax that I'm getting charged on the income I'm making from the corporate gig. So filing a Schedule C alongside a W-2 can be very, very helpful. Um, but some proprietors, they use your own social. You don't have a separate uh, employer identification number. You used to be able to do that, not anymore. Uh, so your number is out there. And anytime you need to send a contract or W-9, your social is going to be on everything. Uh, so if you want to have a little bit of separation from that, then you create a partnership or a corporation underneath a, an LLC and have a separate uh, publishing la uh, record label, have a publishing company, you know, separate those out, really start accounting for what income's coming from what and get organized about what it is that you're doing. If it seems overwhelming, find a bookkeeper in your town. Bookkeepers can help you with this. They know Quicken really well. They're like nerdy when it comes to QuickBooks. They love doing it. They love to sit down and like show you, see, you can do this, this, and this. And I'm like, uh huh, uh huh. And after about five clicks, I'm lost. But that's great. I'm going to pay you to do that because uh, it's just, it's above my pay grade. Can I do an invoice? Sure. Can I, you know, put, accept the payment in there and do the swipe on the little dongle that goes on the iPad? Yeah, sure. Outside of that, I, I don't want to. I, I'm happy to pay somebody to do that work. And you can also file DBAs. So like Skyline Entertainment and Publishing is an LLC. And we also DBA, do business as Toolshed Studios. So we've got those names and we filed those fictitious name statements with a local paper. We did it in San Jose Mercury News. So anybody, it's now public record. Anybody can go look and go, oh, I want to use that name. Oh, it's taken. Uh, and we also have the websites. That's usually how people find that those names are taken. And um, federal state tax requirements, if you've got a, a corporation or LLC, it's really just a, a state tax minimum that you have. And it's not really until you get into the multiple six figures that you really start getting hit hard with the tax. And then do you need an attorney? You know, I'm not going to tell you whether you need to get an attorney or not. It's been talked about today. Um, attorneys are definitely critical. They vary in their expertise. So there's some attorneys that are really good at copyright and uh, trademarks and patents. There's others that are really good specifically at business planning or there's tax attorneys. So you got business planning attorneys, you got tax attorneys, you got attorneys that are really good about contracts or IP. So you need to find the attorney that's right for the typical business that you have. Good place to start is calawyersforthearts.org. There is a bunch of other uh, sites and different states, because uh, not everybody's in California, which is another wonderful thing of us being online. So you can find uh, lawyers for the arts in your particular state. Insurance, I'm going to go through this pretty fast, but um, you don't have to get insurance, but you probably should have it. If you've got any equipment and you're making money from your gear, you should have insurance. Here's why. So something happens, God forbid, you know, something gets damaged in your home, pipe breaks, something worse, something gets taken out of your car. Um, uh, I just had a friend do that. He literally bought a microphone. The night he bought the microphone, uh, the car got smashed and the microphone was in the car, gone that day. So we had, uh, you know, oh, <laughs> when you get gear, especially if it's hardware, Take a picture of the serial number with your phone and create a little album in your phone that's got all the serial numbers for everything you've bought. Do screenshots, right? When you get your the key, right? When you activate, don't just rush and activate that plug-in or that software. 
keep a copy of that stuff, take screenshots, take pictures of boxes that have the serial number on the box because that can come in very handy. So let's say the, this microphone, uh, for instance. So the microphone is in the car and let's say it's a pretty expensive microphone and you file a police report, you send it to your insurance company and they go, oh, what, what's this? Oh, it's a microphone. What do you use that microphone for? Oh, well, I'm a, uh, uh, a pastor at a church and I got this really expensive microphone to have better audio quality. We're doing streaming. I said, oh, so you use that for a business purpose? Well, yeah. Oh, we're not going to cover that. But it was in my car and my car got broken into. Right. But, but that, that's not really a personal item. We cover personal items. So having business insurance is very important. If you got a laptop, right, and you're producing on your laptop, um, you might want to get insurance to cover that separate. Would it get covered if it was taken from your vehicle? Yeah, but they might cover 500 bucks and you might have a $2,500 laptop. So just insurance, I can't recommend enough. You know, we've got a pretty sizable um, policy and it doesn't cost as much per month as you would think. Is it a significant amount? Sure. As a percentage of our overall liabilities, it's like five, six percent of our total liabilities for the month. It's not a, not a, but if something were to happen, we have people that physically come here. So we have to have, you know, slip and fall coverage, all of that sort of stuff. So because I want to get to q and I'm going to cover just a couple other things on here. e and So if you are going to be selling your music, unless you know every song ever written, or you went to school and you are a musicologist by trade or by, um, by, by graduate degree, I would suggest getting e and insurance once you start making money from placements and licensing your music. Because at some point, you're going to write something that's going to sound like something else close enough that a jury might find in favor of the original artist or original songwriter or whoever filed that original copyright. That's the case. e and insurance will cover you. If not, that could be the end of your business. Knocking on wood. Don't want that to happen to anybody. But if you start making significant money, insurance is super, super helpful. Okay. Fast, fast, fast. Get this done in two and a half minutes. Um, protecting assets. So this actually has been talked about quite a bit today. And I'm just going to refer back to Jesse Bishop's presentation on IP and protecting assets. Uh, he was on at 1230 today. Go back and watch that 17 times. Watch it and then rewatch it. And just really understand the, the, the concepts around reading contracts, watching, watching what's coming in the door, having a, a, some ready to go documents that you can send to uh, work for hire. Like I was talking about hiring musicians earlier um, or producer artist agreements, get those. And we actually pay for uh, uh, legal protection. We have a legal protection plan that we pay for again, part of our expenses every month. Every time I have a contract, I send it off document review, send it back. Doesn't cost me a dime. Um, but we do that maybe more frequently than somebody who's starting out. I definitely, when we were starting out, we didn't need it that much. But now it's become something we needed, so we bought that service. So as you grow, that those are expenses that are definitely worth having. Uh, and then getting your own documents, our studio agreement, our internship agreement, our musician for hire agreement, producer, um, artist agreements, all those things we've had legal reviewed. They work for us. They might not work for somebody else, but and sometimes they need to be edited. If there's significant edits, we send them to be reviewed um split sheets if you're writing music with other people and you're not using a split sheet shame that's all i'm gonna say if you watch game of thrones ding 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 shame shame um and then copywriting your music ircs isnes ipis upcs all that other alphabet soup if you don't know what those are go to ddex.net you also should go to the mlc.com and register with the mlc if you're putting out music you should be registered with the mlc sound exchange as well uh, and I got one minute clearances. Okay. So this, this, um, I chart, it's 190 doc documents. Do you need all those documents? No, but there are documents in there. I'm certain that you probably need. There's a lot of different forms. Um, and again, we talked about it before CA lawyer for the arts, go watch Jesse Bishop's presentation. And then the other clearance sale, Clarence, right? Clarence forms and clearance sales. One of the things that we've done to build up our, our 
mic closet here and other gear is we've made friends at Musicians Friends, Sweetwater, Full Compass, um, ZZ Sounds, um, LA Pro Audio, different places that call us when things come in. They're like, hey, we just got this in. Maybe it's not, for, oh, Vintage King. Maybe it's not for us at the time, but we still get kind of a phone call to say, hey, we know you guys have some vintage mics in your closet. Maybe you want to trade this one for that, that sort of thing. So having connections, and that's what the salespeople at those organizations need. They need names in their register. That's what they get paid to do and make outreach and send you a note and tell you, hey, the sale's going on. We're going to sell our demo U47. That's how we have a U47. We bought it right off the show floor at one of those retailers. So having uh, connections at these uh, organizations is, is really great. Um, all right, split sheets I talked about. I'm going to just say split sheets again. So you remember split sheets and then building a team. Suzanne um, Yeda covered this really, really well. So I'm not going to go into it too much, but get involved. Find the local SCORE representative in your area, Service Corps Retired uh, Executives. They will help you write your business plan. Business plans can help you get lending. Um, join your Chamber of Commerce. Yes, there's a cost involved, but you get to go to events and somebody says, oh, hey, can you make music for my salon? Sure, you're, I can make uh, eight hours worth of music, maybe 16, 24, 40 hours worth of music so you don't have any repeats. Um, and I'm happy to do that for X amount of money. Now you're making custom music for somebody's salon that you met through the Chamber of Commerce. Um, get involved with colleges, community, local programs. Know all of your other engineers in the area. Tracking places, mixing places, mastering engineers, and all the local venues because you need them to be sending you referrals. We got a re referral because we have a Steinway piano and we needed uh, work done on the Steinway. And now... The Steinway office in Los Altos knows that we have a 120-year-old Steinway that sounds amazing. And they get calls from people that want to just rent a Steinway to record something. Well, they're going to rent it. Good luck to them. They got to get it tuned. Then they got to have the gear to record it. Well, instead, they can just come to our studio and get that all done in one day. So having connections is really, really important uh in your local area aes your alumni network through your school the gaming audio networking guild the gang if you're not familiar i know there's a lot of gamers we're on twitch there's a lot of gamers as part of this um uh group that like to make uh music for video games recording academy and then society of motion picture and television uh, engineers at SEMPTI. and then learning where to go where to read school formal certifications expanding your biography and getting your credits all the time, all the time. Credits, credits, credits. Can't talk enough about credits. And I went two minutes over the time I wanted to. So now maybe Gene uh, or, although I couldn't hear Gene when he was talking earlier. So whoever comes back in for the Q&A, hopefully I'll be able to hear them. Back in. Hello, Gibbs. Can you hear me? Are you mm. able to hear me? Oh, I see a chat. Oh, that's just a different room. And no, I can't hear. I could hear when we were in the uh, the green there room, I could hear just fine and also was able to hear. <laughs> I think we have a little <laughs> latency. I was trying to bring my microphone a little closer. There we, there we go. Okay. I'm hearing a big echo. That's okay. Um, so we do have a few questions in the chat. And it's very disconcerting to hear yourself <laughs> twice. Um, so let me start with this one. Um, somebody was asking, should I register if I use my own music in my YouTube videos? And I think that registration was probably related to... MLC or something. Yeah, an MLC. 100%. Yeah, you, you should. If you're distributing your music, through uh, any sort of platform, StrokeKid, TuneCore, whatever you might be. Um, oh, my screen share is up, so everybody's seeing my <laughs> my mixer. I need to pull down that, pull this thing. Um, then, yeah, you should be registering with Exchange, uh, the MLC, um, because they're going to be collecting royalties that TuneCore, DistroKid, or The Orchard, or CD Baby, whoever you're distributing your your uh, money with, uh, money you're collecting your handles with uh, through your music might not be collecting. District is not going to collect 
it on the radio somewhere. So you definitely should register. And you and and I also did not talk about PROs. So BMI, ASCAP, because if somebody hears your music and wants to license it, they're going to go to BMI, they're going to go to ASCAP, they're going to look in the repertory, and they're going to try to see if they can figure out who owns this. And if your contact information, the publishing label you correct col- um, create, and they click the drop down to expand that, and there's no email address, there's no phone number, you may you may miss out on opportunities to get your music place that you never know existed because you didn't have your contact information in ASCAP or BMI, or if you're invited to be part of CSAC. And Gibbs, would you also say that's true when you're, um, you know, just to go on that thread for a second, um, when you're about to embark on a project with somebody that you are able to um, give them those numbers at the beginning of the process, or is it okay if you do it later? So you mean like your IPM, your individual uh, uh, yeah, party ID identifier? Yeah, I yeah. mean, if you, you, you should... Yeah, if you register with uh, BMI or ASCAP, you're going to re- get an IPI. And with that IPI, that should be put in with, or with DistroKid, with whomever it is that you're um, distributing your music through. Then that is like your social security number as a, as a writer, as a uh, performer. And then that's how they're going to tie the industry. Um, in, in international standard recording code, the IRSRC for the record to the IPI of the writer. So you definitely, and you, you can have multiple IPIs. You can have an IPI as a publisher, IPI as a writer, and all of those need to be linked so that way everybody's finding your audio correctly because all that metadata gets embedded into the music. So as it goes out into the world, it gets picked up and maybe some college radio station starts playing it. Well, you want to make sure that you're getting appropriately credited for that. Um, I wanted so to ask you... you... Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Gibbs. There's a little latency. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I was going to ask you next, DJ Honeypants was asking about, do you know what's reasonable for a producer, engineer, and how do I find one? Uh, $8,000 an hour. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, <laughs> if you're if you're going to hire one, because I took it from the standpoint of you want to be one. Um, th- look, uh, streaming royalties are not significant. If you've got a good marketing plan, and you know you're going to be making more than just streams from the, the, the online services, then say, okay, I'm willing to spend. X and somebody's charging you 25 bucks an hour, 50 bucks an hour, a hundred bucks an hour. If you're able to look at the work that they've done and you feel that the quality of work is worth that, it is a get, you get what you pay for. There's a lot of people that charge 25 bucks an hour, 35 bucks an hour, some that charge 50. Um, if you feel that their work is worth that, then sure. But you want to make sure that you have a conversation ahead of time and have a plan and say, okay, I really need to limit this to five hours of work because I don't want to go over that $250 budget. Okay, here's what we can get done in that amount of time. So think about what your project is worth because people that get work done for free, that tends to be about what your project winds up being worth in the end. If you don't invest in the project, it typically doesn't come back to you. Gibbs, this next question is a little bit more about brand. And um, kind of going back to your experience, how did you know when you were ready to hop from the corporate world? Yeah, um, good, good question. The The Grammy didn't hurt um, because that happened to be the same year. But uh, I, mean, I was just one engineer on that album. I wasn't, you know, my, the, the there's a certificate, not a statue for a reason because in that category, Engineers just get certificates, not statues, uh, you know, gramophones, and that was a, was a big help. But the knowing that we were making enough money that even though the income was going to drop by losing the um, the corporate income, having to get my own health insurance, all of those considerations, the numbers had reached a point where 
there was enough and, and I was getting to, to kind of burnout mode because I was working 60 hours a week at the job and it was 20, 30 hours a week of production. And then I pushed that down to 50, but then it went to 40 in the production. And then I pushed it down, the work job down to 40 and this was up to 50. So the, just the ratio of time I was putting in made sense. So it was a, it was a combination of factors, but I was at a point where I felt I could pay the rent and the walk. Gibbs, we have reached our time and just want to thank you so much for giving yours. We really thank you for having you today. A lot of great content today. Awesome. I think we're going to head into break. And if you guys want to reach Gibbs, what's the best contact information? Gibbs at skyline.com. Yeah, we can make sure we put that in the chat too. Awesome. Thank you. And um, everybody, we're counting down to our last presentation of the day. Um, a friend of Gibbs, uh, Julius Dobos, will be speaking next. Thanks awesome. again, Gibbs. And we're going to tune off until um, uh, 7.15. And next we have Julius. Sorry, I'm talking on Nashville time. I'm, I'm actually not on the coast right now. So what would that make it? <laughs> 5.15. 5.15 is our next presentation. So come back for that one.